The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on China Africa relations through training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by CGSP's Africa editor, Jérôme Nima. A very good morning to you, Jérôme. Morning, Eric. It has been a very busy week in China-Africa relations. Today, we're not going to talk too much about the news. Kenya's foreign affairs minister, he arrived in Beijing for a three-day visit. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has been on a four-nation tour in Africa, China, of course, being a very significant undercurrent of that trip. But today, we want to kind of step back from the news in Africa and Jero, we're going to go to China. And this is a country that you and I have spent a long time in over the years. But it's a topic in terms of the African diaspora that lives in China is an issue that we haven't addressed in several years. In fact, dating back to some of the difficulties that black residents and African diaspora in Guangzhou encountered during COVID. And since then, it's been rather quiet. But a story popped up earlier this week that caught both of our attention when the Nigerian consul general from Shanghai, Chimezi Okuyoma Ugu, he went to the Zhejiang trading city of Iwu. And that, again, is in Zhejiang province. Iwu, for those of you not familiar, is one of the major trading hubs for Africans in China, along with Guangzhou. And the consul general went there and he made a plea to African traders not to send back counterfeit, substandard, and fake products back to Africa. And I just thought that was very interesting, Giro, because we rarely see African diplomats and stakeholders address other Africans on this issue, in part because the assumption is that fake goods imported from China into Africa is done by the Chinese, when in fact, as we've heard here from the Consul General and what we're going to talk about in today's show, it's a lot more complicated than that. And it also speaks to the question of the African trading population in Iwu and the different communities of Africans throughout China. You've lived there for 10 years, all the way up until 2016. Tell us a little bit about some of the different populations in Guangzhou, in Iwu, in Shanghai, in Beijing and other places, and how they vary in terms of the African diaspora in China. It was really a very interesting kind of profile of population yet that you do find among African diaspora in China. For people like me who lived in Beijing, you really have the student living much more in Beijing, the student diplomats and those who are coming for official visits were living in Beijing. In Shanghai, it was almost the same. But when the more you go down south in Iwu, in Guangzhou, the profile changed. You have the student, but you also have much more the traders. And you also have those who came to become a student, but later on, the easiness to do business, to make money in this commercial hub just made them from student to become businessmen, to become traders. That was really an interesting change, that transformation that was going to happen among the African population. But yes, you had that different kind of profile. It was really interesting to also see how African traders would come to China. They'll do business, and this is my personal experience. They'll do business, and they'll go to manufacturers, and manufacturer will show them different products. For example, the same jeans, the same Levi jeans. You see, they'll tell them, you, this is a very high-quality kind of jean. You can sell it for this price. This is the medium quality, and this is the very low quality. And what would be interesting, you'd see that Many African traders will choose the low, very low quality of the Levi product and they'll go back to Africa and they'll sell it to the price of a high price quality of the Levi they did not buy from China. And of course, that will come with reputational damage about Chinese product. And I would be telling people, you know, in China, they don't always make fake product. They also make high hand good product. But, you know, our traders, they just choose the lesser cost for the maximum of the benefit they can get from Chinese product. Yeah, that was a really interesting experience to live with those uh, African traders and the population there. Now, when you lived in China between 2006 and 2016, the African diaspora population was quite robust. In fact, for a long time, Guangzhou was home to the largest overseas African population in all of Asia. And back then, 
it was a lot easier for Africans to live and travel in China. First of all, the cost of living was much lower. China's become much more expensive as it's developed, and so it's been much more difficult for traders who operate on very, very thin margins to eke out an existence there. And then secondly, in the post-COVID era, the visa restrictions have gotten much more severe. And so it's just more difficult for people to stay there for extended periods of time. And so the life of Africans in China has changed dramatically over the past five or 10 years from the time when you were there to where we are today. Again, as we mentioned at the top of the show, we haven't heard much about this, but we have a very special treat for you today because there's a new book that came out by a, just a wonderful author, Nu Sarawiwa, and it's entitled Black Ghosts, A Journey into the Lives of Africans in China. And Jiro, you and I had a chance to speak with Nu last week to understand her story. And again, it's remarkable that this is someone who is not a sociologist, not an anthropologist, not a political scientist. She's a travel writer. And she came to the story with very little knowledge about China and the diaspora from Africa that's there. And yet she told a story that was colorful, full of nuance, the complexity that this story deserves. And it was just a very, very powerful story. And we were very privileged to have the chance to speak with her about this book that, by the way, won the Financial Times Book of the Year 2023 in the travel category. It is not entirely a travel book, though, but it is part travelogue. And so let's take a listen now to our conversation with author Nu Sarawiwa about her book, Black Ghosts, A Journey into the Lives of Africans in China. Nu Sarawiwa, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Congratulations on the new book. It was absolutely fantastic, and I'm just very excited to have the chance to talk with you about it. No, thank you. I'm really excited to be here. Well, you're an accomplished travel writer, and in fact, this book was recognized by the Financial Times as one of the travel books of the year last year. It just came out in 2023, so that's a pretty impressive accomplishment. And so when I started reading the book, I thought this was going to be more of a travel log through southern China and through the African diaspora communities. And then going through the book, it turns into there's a little bit of anthropology, there's sociology, and by the end, we're full on politics and governance and comparing Ubuntu to Confucianism. And this journey took a lot of different directions. When you embarked on the project to do this book, what did you have in mind? I think the title of the book is slightly misleading. I had to shorten it so that it's just Africans in China. But what I actually wanted to do was to explore the communities specifically in San Yuan Li and Xiao Bei in Guangzhou. And that's kind of primarily what I did, but I added in Hong Kong because it ended up being very interesting, being in Chungking mansions. And then just a couple of people that I came across uh, serendipitously. So it was never meant to be this very sort of exhaustive trip around different cities around China. It was those two districts in Guangzhou specifically that I wanted to do. And uh, but then, you know, it's sort of, uh, I found myself being quite interested in the anthropology and the history. And then I came across that book by Emmanuel Heavy about uh, students in China during the 60s. And so I thought I would add those elements as well. You just mentioned the title of the book, and it's really interesting because when I read the title of the book, I was like, wow, it's interesting because it reminds me of the expression of uh, that you do find in Chinese expression. And the first reading of your book, we realized that you know that expression, but somehow you kept that title of your book. Weren't you afraid that at some point you're going to have maybe to translate the book in Chinese or any if Chinese kind of come to read the book, because we do hope they're going to read the book, that it's going to either to reinforce the stereotype in a certain way or you wanted the title to be provocative or what was the approach that you had with that title? Yeah, I wasn't actually thinking in terms of the Chinese title at all. <laughs> I thought about the literal translation into English being Black Ghost and how in England that has that double meaning of being invisible in some way. And that's what I had in mind when I chose that as a title. And uh, yeah, I wasn't thinking at all in terms of the literal Chinese translation. 
Yeah, let's dive into those neighborhoods in Guangzhou that first attracted you to this story and this adventure that you embarked on. These are well-known neighborhoods. You referenced the moniker Chocolate City. That is what they've been known for a long time. The Chinese population in Guangzhou for a long time was the largest African diaspora population in Asia. It's gotten a lot smaller in recent years, in part because of the pandemic, visa controls, the cost of living in China has gone up. Introduce us to these neighborhoods and tell us about the stories and the characters you met there. Yeah, so I first heard about these uh, neighborhoods uh, in the newspapers and I was intrigued because I didn't realize that there was this huge African community in China. You really don't think about China as being a place where Africans can actually settle and live, especially because of the language barrier. So as soon as I discovered this, I was like, right, I have to go and, and, and check this out. So I found out a lot of the communities were centered around Xiaobei and San Yuan Li. And so that's where I decided I wanted to explore. And I wanted to keep it simple, just those two districts. But of course, I landed first in Hong Kong and uh, Got a little sidetracked there. But then, yeah, so I went, first of all, to Xiaobei. And I think back then you still had the Africa Trading Mall, which isn't there anymore. But that was a place where I could meet lots of the kind of Africans who come over to, on short-stay visas to buy small commodities and send them back to their various home countries uh, for a profit. And I think, you know, the bulk of Africans in the city, in Guangzhou, were doing that sort of thing. I think over the decades, I know Nigeria, for certain, has stopped manufacturing certain small goods, and China has taken over the manufacture of them, and you've seen that all over the world. And so a lot of Africans will go over to Guangzhou, which is the manufacturing capital of China, and buy some of these goods and send them back. And I was really curious as to how you can make a profit from that. I didn't really understand how you could spend hundreds of dollars flying over to China and then buy products and put them in the crate and then send them back and make a profit. So I, you know, I spoke to a few people about that and got a real sense of how precarious an activity it, it can be. There are so many pitfalls. You can arrive in China because you don't speak the language you're doing business with wholesalers, Chinese wholesalers. So you might not necessarily guarantee the quality of the products that you want. You might not be able to guarantee that you can receive your products in time. And so they're under all these time pressures. And then they have to deal with the customs in China as well as uh, their home country. And then they also have to hope that the person at the other end can be trusted to sell the goods and return the profits. And so I met people and also heard about people through stories I was told who, you know, had many struggles in, in that regard. I mean, there, you know, there was one woman who uh, she had ordered some fabric and she hadn't quite got the shipment that she wanted, but she was only on a very short stay visa. And so she had this dilemma where she needed to stay in the country longer, but she didn't have the money to stay in the country. And, and I don't think her visa allowed for it either. And so, you know, she was quite uh, distressed by that. So there are those kind of stories. But I also met guys who came over here to either play football or coach football in different cities around the country. I met a guy, Ikem, he sold jewellery and he had quite a big presence over in San Yuan Li. I guess Xiao Bei is very francophone. That was the first thing that hit me when I got there, was that people were from African countries that were francophone and often Muslim. They came from places like Mali and Senegal. So there was a slight language barrier for me and it was, it was quite intimidating. Then I went over to San Yuan Li. There, is, there are more Nigerians and Ghanaians. It's English speaking. And, uh, and so I spent a lot of my time in, in San Yuanli uh, instead. And I met uh, visa overstayers who were uh, spending their days effectively hiding in the basement of one of the shopping centers. And, you know, they all had different reasons for overstaying their visas. And again, it's, you know, they were the victims of fraud, uh, which led to poverty, which then led to them having to sell their passports. 
And then, but then you also met the other kind of Africans who were really enjoying themselves in China. You know, they went over there to create a better life for themselves. They, they were entrepreneurs and they were successful at what they did. And some of them even married local women and they raised mixed race children there and were very happy. So, you know, there's a whole sort of range of, of people and circumstances that I encountered there. There is a lot to impact to, with what you've just said. I have a lot of questions coming to my mind, but I think I'm going to start with one of the simplest ones, because when we read your book, you describe a different type of people in Siberian Lean, as you just mentioned, in Xiaobe, and uh, when you also describe the differences between those who stay there and those who just come for short term, and you even describe that you, know, you find more mixed people, male and female among those who come and those who visit and those who leave and they go, and those who stay they're younger male and they're there they're more like present there so you also describe how much sometimes it was difficult to talk to them so that's why i wanted to know since you really wanted to talk to them and given the different circumstances they found themselves in how easy it was for you being a nigerian british just coming to visit was how easy it was it for you to get in touch with them to share with you the experience Yeah, it was, it was a mix. It was very difficult on some level. There were a lot of people who didn't want to talk to me. They had a, a deep suspicion of journalists and the media. Even though I didn't say I was a journalist, I think some of them sensed that I was because they don't meet many Nigerians with kind of English accents uh, who are hanging around there. <laughs> so uh, Give away. Exactly. And, and so, you know, some people were very circumspect very wary. And I would spend day after day striking up conversations. But also, you're being female, it also helped in many ways too, because a lot of the men would want to talk to me because there aren't that many women around. And so there was one canteen called Chimamandas. I don't think it's there anymore. But I would have lunch there. And I'd be sitting and talking to a guy. And then when that conversation finished, I would try to leave and then some other guy would call me over for conversation and then another and then another. So it was quite easy to strike up conversations with people. But whether those conversations revealed a lot about themselves, it varied from person to person. So it was very, very tough. And I went back to China actually about three months ago. I dipped in for just a couple of days with a friend who's Hong Kong Chinese but grew up in London. So she saw me striking up conversations with the few people who were still there. And she said, wow, this is, it's very, very difficult. You know, she witnessed my struggle and the variation in, in outcomes, really. Sometimes you'd have very in-depth conversations with people who are very frank and willing to offload their problems and their complaints and, and their happiness. And then others just clammed up. So that's why I had to spend a good sort of three, four months there <laughs> in order to get the interviews. Yeah. It's interesting because gender, sexuality and relationships was a theme that went through the book in terms of the trader community and how, as you said, it's predominantly male. And then some of the diaspora Africans had relationships both in China, but also back home In Nigeria, you talked about the complexities of that, and there's a loneliness for a lot of the men who are there because they're separated from culture, and there's not, as you pointed out, a lot of viable partners there. Talk a little bit about, again, those questions of your gender, but also the dynamics of the diaspora community, gender and sexuality that you came across in terms of how also you went to some of the nightclubs and people assumed that you were a prostitute, you said, automatically, because why would a single woman be in these nightclubs, you know? And so, but again, it all plays in the fabric of this very complex you know, culture that you, you uncovered. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, as you mentioned earlier, it was uh, a lot of the people who actually settle in China as opposed to staying short term tended to be male. I think that sort of migration is really a man's game. And some of them, I mean, there was one guy I spoke to. He was kind of typical of the sort of Igbo ethnic guy that comes to China hoping to save enough money so that he can get married. Because you can't just get married if you have nothing. You need to be able to provide 
a home for your wife and that sort of thing. And so uh, you had men who were in China, you know, desperately trying to save up money and make something of themselves so they could then go back to Nigeria. But, uh, you know, while they were out there, there's obviously a, a shortage of, of Nigerian women to go out with. And while some of them were willing to date women outside of their race or, or nationality, I think a lot of them were just single and uh, who knows? I, I couldn't get any frank discussions with many of them about a single life in Guangzhou, but you definitely got the sense that uh, they were missing women a lot out there. And, you know, it's very, very difficult. And so the women who do stay, they're often the ones that I encountered were either married to African men and were living out there as a family, or I was told they were prostitutes. And of course, I didn't look like I don't look like a prostitute. So I've got short hair, and I <laughs> and I wear uh, trainers and flat shoes. But people get so used to these roles, these gender roles. And so when I did go to a nightclub, the Kama nightclub that everyone recommended I go to, people found it very difficult to place me because I wasn't wearing a dress. And <laughs> I guess I would imagine I was older than your typical prostitute. And so that was quite amusing, just kind of watching these guys looking at me and, and trying to place me in that context. And then, you know, you had uh, the guys who had relationships with Chinese women and married them and... Uh, and, you know, there were, there were, it was quite interesting seeing them raise their children in this environment where obviously their Chinese family has more cultural power in some respects. And, yeah, I remember there was one guy that I met. He was in Hong Kong and he was saying how his in-laws were dismayed the fact that their daughter had married an African man and uh, they didn't realise that he'd learnt Chinese. And so he overheard their conversations about him and they were warning his wife, oh, don't marry him. These Africans, they have wives already back home and, you know, you're just their piece on the side while they're in China, etc., etc. So a lot of tensions there. But, you know, I also saw people who were very happily married and, uh, and I, I don't know if their children what life will be like for their children. I guess there's a whole generation of uh, mixed race Afro-Chinese babies who will be coming of age, I suppose, in, in the next few years. And it'll be quite interesting to see what uh, their experiences were like. On the issue of marriage, that it's, I like those issues because I remember when I was living in China, as a student, we had friends who would be dating Chinese girls and everything, but they also have that feeling that they will never get married to a Chinese woman. And the perspective, of course, was different when you live in the north in Beijing, when you live in the south in cities like Guangzhou or even Hong Kong. So the idea was like, as you mentioned, the, you know, the family is different, the culture is different, and they might even have maybe a racial problem into that context. So so many young African students I know would be dating girls for like, I say, for opportunistic view, for like, kind of like feel the loneliness, feel the gap they're feeling as a student, but they will never go into marrying us. Some will do, but most of them they won't. But you've noticed that, you know, many of them are marrying Chinese. Do you think that many of them was like based on like on an opportunistic view or perspective in a way to say, okay, it's going to be a way for me to secure my presence here in China, knowing that I have a wife back home, or many of them also considered the consequences for their own kids, knowing that, you know, mixed race kids are not always welcome in China so easily. I don't know. It's hard when it comes to marriage. Not everyone will be completely honest with you about their reasons. Do you know what I mean? And, and marriage throughout the world, it can be for love, but it can also be for pragmatic reasons too or a mix of both. And so it's very hard to say. I mean, obviously, when it comes to setting up businesses and, and things, I notice that a lot of successful business partnerships uh, seem to be between an African man and his Chinese wife. I mean, I met, uh, there was a guy called Samson in Chunking Mansions, and he was very frank about having a, he was Nigerian and he had a, a wife back in Nigeria who was Muslim and therefore comfortable with the idea of him being polygamous. And then he had a, a Chinese wife in, in Hong Kong. But then, of course, you know, uh, as my Chinese friends remind me, it's a lot of Chinese men who, who live in Hong Kong would do the same in the sense that they would have a girlfriend in, uh, on the mainland or somewhere. 
uh, Shenzhen or wherever, and uh, as well as their wives. So it's, this is a very kind of common theme throughout history, really. You know, where does love begin and uh, pragmatism end when it comes to marriage? I, I, you know, and I saw examples of all types when I was, when I was out there. I'd like to go back a bit on the comment that you made earlier when you talked to people that you've met. You say you've met also overstayers. I was kind of struck back when you talk about you present them as victims of like, I don't know, poverty, immigration and all. But I'm going to take from a Chinese perspective because when you live in China, you hear a lot of those criticism about overstayers from Chinese police, from Chinese authorities, how Africans come, they stay, they don't want to go back and everything. And it creates social tension, especially to cities like Guangzhou. We've been that way. We We've seen a lot of social tension between African communities and Chinese communities. The overstayers that you had the opportunity to talk with them, how and what was the reason for them not to want to go back, to be willing to stay in Guangzhou, but still in the hiding? But the idea to go back, they still didn't want to go back. What was the reason for them to adopt that position? You know, I mean, one guy I spoke to, he just, he didn't want to go back to Nigeria because he felt there were no opportunities there. He would rather live in China without documentation than go back to Nigeria. And that's quite interesting. I find that migration and people's perceptions of opportunity in different countries can vary so much. You know, one person can view Nigeria as a land of opportunity. And then the next person is like, no, no, I'll die if I go back there. I must stay in China. There was, you know, one guy that, I don't think I mentioned him in the book, but uh, he ran out of money and he sold his passport. And he had no money and he was terrified of being caught by the Chinese authorities and being put in prison and deported. And then he also had, uh, I spoke to one trader who was telling me about how someone commits fraud, you know, they ship the trader ships over their goods back to, you know, let's say Nigeria, and that their parents or their friend or their relative steals the profits. And so the person, the trader back in China is left stranded. They have no money. They spent it all on goods that they never made a profit from. And I was told that they might try and deal with the matter in a vigilante way because the police system doesn't really work in Nigeria. And so they might arrange for someone in Nigeria to use force, <laughs> physical force, to obtain the profits from the person who's stolen them. And this can just create a sort of tit-for-tat situation in which the person, the fraudster at the Nigerian end, then worries that if the trader comes back to Nigeria, they will seek revenge or, you know, or uh, justice. And, uh, and, and might end up dealing with that person preemptively, if you know what I mean. And so these are the stories that I was told. And so, yeah, there are a lot of reasons why people might be you know, nervous about going back uh, to their home countries and would rather stick it out in China. So many of the African diaspora in Guangzhou live in this gray zone of legality, given what you described as the arbitrary visa policy of the Chinese. And China is a different kind of country than many other countries in that it doesn't have an immigration department. The enforcement of immigration is something that's handled at the local level and all levels. The hotels check visas. You have to register with the police. There's a surveillance state that exists around that, that these African migrants have to navigate very carefully. And it feels like it's an enormous weight on these individuals as they're trying to eke out a living, trading, dealing with the politics of what you just described back home with the scrupulous, you know, business dealings. And at the same time, this very complex legal nightmare that they have to go through oftentimes. Again, maybe tell us a little bit about some of the stories that you encountered in terms of this life in the gray area of living in between visas and marriages and all of this and how they survive, you know, that maze that they have to go through. Yeah, I mean... Just simply traveling within China, you know, as you know, it's you have to, unlike other countries, you have to present your identification, your passport, just to... You can even get a cell phone number. I mean, everything has to have an ID attached to it. Exactly. And so they can't travel by train. And that would be kind of 
quite expensive anyway. And so I think you can travel by like a small bus, perhaps. That's what I heard, that they could do those intercity journeys, but it would have to be by those small buses where you don't necessarily have to present uh, documentation. And so the guys that I spoke to in San Juan Lee were sitting in the basement and hiding from the police and only coming out after certain hours, like in the evening. So it was a very kind of strange existence. And I mean, I found myself on the receiving end of the of this very arbitrary immigration policy because I, I went back to Hong Kong to renew my tourist visa to re-enter the mainland. And the second time I did it, the first time was fine. The second time I was denied a visa. And I asked why I was applying, because I was applying with a British passport. And they said, well, you were born in Nigeria. <laughs> and I said, but I'm not applying as a Nigerian citizen. I've got a British passport. And they said, we don't care. You're born in Nigeria and we're not giving visas to Nigerians. And so I was do you think that's because of the nationality? Sorry to interrupt you. Do you think that's because of the nationality? Or and you raised this very sensitive issue of race that had a white Nigerian, let's say, submitted the same passport, would they have had the same response? And blackness is a key question here. Well, there's barely such a thing as a white Nigerian, so I, I guess... Or we, we, let's say it's a white South African, for example, in the same situation. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not really one to judge that at all. The thing is, with Nigeria, Nigeria means black to a, a pretty much you know, inseparable. So it's very difficult. So you'd, you'd have to ask a South African, really. And I really don't think that the comparison in South Africa is can really do it here because, Eric, when you put it in the context, you'll see that Nigeria has a special context in the case of immigration in China and in terms of reputation also over the world comparing to South Africa. So being South Africa, I think whether it was a black or a white South African, I think the treatment would have been quite different. So, yeah, because it's South Africa, it's not Nigeria. So I think in this case, it will be kind of difficult to kind of determine. That's why I say maybe it was a light skinner Nigerian. I'm not even really sure that it's going to be different. But I know there is a strong stereotype in China regarding Nigerians. Not only in China, in many countries the, all over the world. But in your case, it was really surprising because you were using a British passport. Yeah, but again, this illustrates how fluid the Chinese system is because I then went and reapplied somewhere else in a different way the next day and I got my visa. So <laughs> it was, you know, it's just, it's very arbitrary, it seems. They, they don't have these strict rules. You can, they just change the rules on a whim. And that, that's, that's quite frightening as well because it meant that when I then returned to China just three months ago, I was terrified that I might not be allowed in for some arbitrary reason. So, you know, I was really in a sweat <laughs> until I passed immigration. Towards the end of the book, you started transitioning away from the social stories in Guangzhou as your journeys took you up to Wuhan and to some other cities. And when you were in Wuhan, you met with a political science professor, if I recall, and you started to delve into the question of politics and democracy. And one of the observations that I thought was very interesting, which I'd like to get you to expand on, is that you noted that in Nigeria, and, and this is a quote, we have elections, but the government doesn't look after us. But in China, you don't have elections, but the government does look after you. Can you expand on that discussion that you had with that scholar in Wuhan on that topic? Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's scary, isn't it? I and mean, then you meet the men who have Chinese wives and children, you know, and their status within China is still precarious and unpredictable, even though they've put down family roots there. And yeah, I, I, I felt really bad for them, you know, having to live under that cloud of uncertainty all the time. It's, it's difficult. Sometimes you can be really surprised that it's not even the system, it's just the individual behind that office who's received an order saying that every Nigerian, so he reads your application and he sees Nigeria somewhere. He doesn't even care about the visa. He just see born in Nigeria. So he's like, no, you're Nigerian. Say, no, I, I'm born in Nigeria, but you know, I'm not a Nigerian citizen. I'm a British citizen right now. For him, it's like, no, I just saw Nigeria, born in Nigeria. So he closes his mind. It's like he become that square person say no you're not allowed back into the country we had to face with those kind of situations from time to even as a student as well 
Yeah, so Professor Jigong, he'd uh, presided over some research about Africans in China. And so I asked to meet him. And uh, so I met him in, in Wuhan, where he's a, a, a professor. And so, yeah, we were just kind of talking about just the difference, I guess, the political evolution of Nigeria versus China. They're just so opposite. China, the government is extremely centralized. It, it, it obviously has a very tight grip over its population. And, and of course, when I say China looks after its people, I mean, I'm, I'm oversimplifying there. But what I, I meant, in essence, is that it builds infrastructure, it has ambitions to lift people out of poverty. And you can see that there, you know, over the last few decades, there's been this very marked improvement in people's standard of living and in their wages. And the Chinese government knows that if they don't look after their people, there will be unrest because they've had a thousand years of history, you know, of statecraft where they've seen this happen. And so although they don't care about democracy, they know on a pragmatic level that you have to maintain a certain standard of living for a certain proportion of the population in order to maintain calm and peace. Whereas the Nigerian government, you don't get that sense. They're not really on a mission to improve infrastructure and living standards. You know, we've had electricity blackouts for decades. I've never known Nigeria to not have that. And the middle class hasn't been growing at this rate that you see in China. And so, you know, some Africans that I spoke to, they preferred living in China purely for that reason. It was like they don't care if they're discriminated against or the Chinese government can revoke their visa whenever they want. They still prefer to live in a country where the government is making actual efforts to improve the economy and, and living standards for people. You tried to look at some of the origins of that by comparing Confucianism to Ubuntu. And maybe, again, why do you, because China and Nigeria in many respects do have some similarities in that they are a very fractured ethically in terms of tribal. So the Chinese, for example, have had, you've talked about the history, it's been a, you know, thousands of years of, of warring states, of different languages, of different cultures that have been kind of brought together, pulled apart, brought together. Uh, both have been the victims of Western colonialism. But yet you've said there are stark differences that divide the two that have led us to where we are today as well. Yeah, I mean, I don't know whether the differences have led us to where we are today, but there are differences nonetheless. Yeah, it's weird. It's kind of, I mean, they're both very family-oriented societies, but at the same time, it's, how do I explain this? It's, it's kind of China doesn't, like in Africa, there's a sense that the community looks after an individual. And even if a stranger from outside is passing through, there's, you know, there's an obligation to look after that person. And, you know, in China, you have that filial obligation but it's slightly different. And I, I think also because they don't have that sort of organized religion, that like Christianity, and because they have this communist government as well, you don't quite have that civic society, but, you know, sort of the setting up of charities by individuals that can look after the, you know, it's, 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 it's very different in that way, which I, I find quite interesting. It's, uh, but the sense of individuality in both societies is much less compared to the West. You know, you're defined in both societies by your family and, you know, those kind of networks. And I, I think in a lot of Chinese culture, like in films and stuff, it's markedly different, say, from American films where... Americans, they exalt the outlaw, the individual who breaks the rules and is exception, you know, exceptional in that kind of way and has a problem with authority. Whereas the Chinese, you know, I, I remember watching a movie years ago, 20 years ago, and it was about this guy and he grew up in the, in the village, then he went away and he had a you know, completely different profession from his father. And then, but you saw him coming back to the village years later and returning to the farm or whatever it was his father was doing. And, and it was very emotional. It was very, the, the message there was that your obligation is to your, your family and your parents. And so it's weird. I, I don't know. I find it very difficult to discuss, to, to talk about China because it's, it's, it's so contradictory. 
everything that you say about China in terms of its characteristics, the, the, the opposite is also true. <laughs> it's very. I mean, yeah. this is the reason I've devoted. 40 years of my life to it because it's the riddle that can never be solved. <laughs> yeah. it, it really is. You could spend your whole life trying to study it and you'll never get it. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I see you struggling with that same thing. And that is a badge of honor, by the way, because the people who say they figured it out and they understand it and they'll tell you all about it are lying. Exactly. Or, they, or they're ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> those, those simplistic reductionist approaches. And I think that the, the difficulty you're having getting your mind around it is exactly where you're supposed to be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's uh, and obviously I'm, I was only there for three months, so there's yeah, you, you're doing it for forty years. So there's no way I'm gonna make any headway. <laughs> and I am an, a novice. I will admit that you know up front, anybody who has any pretense that they think that they know what's going on in a country as large and complex as this again is a liar. That's you know, and, and you hear that you hear that quite a bit. So you spend three months there during your research. I'm kind of wondering if. You came back from there with that sense of fascination because many Africans, when they go to China, when they see what China has been able to achieve, the changes, and especially when it's the first time, with they arrive with different, you know, you know, apprehension and and all. When they leave, if they stay short term, they kind of leave the country with that sense of fascination. I'm asking that because when you mentioned the conversation you had with that professor talking about governance, accountability, good governance, and democracy, you who live in London, you see the kind of democracy that's happening in London and you see also the kind of democracy they want to implement in Nigeria but where there's no good governance and everything and you go to China and you see what's happening there you see somehow how many Africans who are coming straight from the continent are fascinated by the fact that there's no election here but there's good governance there are road infrastructure you living in between the kind of the two or the three when you left China did you leave China with that feeling of like wow this can be a model that can happen in Africa? Or you, can, or you left there with like, yeah, maybe, maybe not. Well, I think this is the thing. I think we all, everyone fantasizes about the benevolent dictatorship, right? <laughs> we, we, we would all love to have a dictator that doesn't tolerate enemies, but, you know, the actual dictator's values are, are wonderful. You know, and of course, this doesn't exist. But when you look at... China, and in this case, I have to compare China with the UK rather than with Nigeria. You have two countries, you know, if you live in urban areas and you're above the poverty line, it's a similar standard of living in very broad terms. You know, one society is very free in terms of democracy, the other isn't. But when you look at their fundamental problems, it's, it's the same. Both societies have aging populations. Both of them, uh, you know, have to deal with climate change and global warming. Both of them have to deal with youth unemployment and the rising cost of uh, living and housing. Do you know what I mean? And so it's like, it feels like both societies are, are heading in the same direction, but they've taken different paths to get there. And so it's almost a case of, it's up to you as an individual, what kind of society suits you in a sense. There are, you know, there are people such as uh, the gay couple and the, the Chinese one. He really enjoyed his life within China. He wasn't bothered by the fact that they don't have elections. It was, you know, he grew up very poor in rural uh, Zhejiang province. And thanks to the government, he was now living in Guangzhou in a, in a very nice apartment. He was able to live with another man freely. He had a great job as a designer. And he could go on holiday to Vietnam and Hong Kong and Thailand whenever he felt like it. So life for him was wonderful. And he doesn't care if the government is being corrupt or it's denying people rights, et cetera, et cetera. And there are people who argue that the UK government is corrupt in its own way. It's just not quite as apparent as it is in uh, countries like China or Nigeria. So... Um, yeah, it's, it's quite complicated. It, it's, it's about whether you, you, you care about principles or you're more interested in just the pragmatic struggle of living. Um, but there are some people who, you know, as long as they can just live their life the way they want it, they don't care what the government's doing. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to see how, in some ways, China is very different from people, but its problems and where it's heading is the same as everywhere else. The book is Black Ghosts, A Journey into the Lives of Africans in China by Nu Sarawiwa. Nu, thank you so much for taking the time. Again, 
it was really just a thrill for me after listening to the book. And I really recommend that everybody, first of all, buy the book. But if you're going to buy it, download the audio book because Nu narrates it. And it's as if you're with her on this journey from Guangzhou to Hong Kong to Zhejiang up to Wuhan, Beijing, all over. And it was just absolutely fascinating. I love the accents that you brought into it and the passion you brought to the to the story. And it was great. It was fantastic. And again, this is we've been doing this show for 15 years now, and we don't get excited about books that often now. But this one I really, really recommend. And unlike the the academic scholars who we interview on this program, whose books cost $150, this one is actually affordable on Amazon. I'll put the links in the show notes. New Sarawiba, thank you once again for your time today. We really appreciate it. No, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. Jiro, again, it was a thrill for me to have the chance to talk to New Sarawiba. By the way, if New's last name sounds familiar to a lot of people, her father is the great Nigerian author Ken Sarawiwa, and so clearly storytelling is in her blood, in her DNA, and this story that she told, what I loved most about it was the complexity that she brought to the issue. She resisted the simplistic, reductive narratives that too often frame what we've talked about over all these many years, the China-Africa discourse, especially about the complexities of the African diaspora population in China, which, as she pointed out over and over again in the book and in our conversation, is diverse and complex. And I think that complexity is so important. Yes, I love the way she wrote the book and the way she was even expressing the complexity of those communities. And you even notice when we're asking the question, she didn't have like a clear A or B answer. She was like, you know, it depends on who you meet, who you talk to. And I like that because she not fell into the trap of, you know, simplifying the narrative or putting all African African community or African diaspora or even Nigerian diaspora in one box. She really acknowledged the fact that you have different profile, different stories and different approach to the situation and in different relationship to what was happening down there. And it even reflected on how some were willing and easy to interact with uh, somewhere like nah, we're not going to do that we're more yeah, we 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 are more like imprudent on who you are talk we are talking to those kind of issue so yeah it speaks to you a lot about how african diaspora african immigration in china is very very much diverse and i do believe that if she even went a bit north shanghai beijing she would have even discovered a different life of african community with different approach with and different ways of perceiving china overall you mentioned Chinese immigration. Let me just clarify one point that I made earlier in the show when I said China doesn't have an immigration service. They do, of course, have an immigration department where you and I and all other foreigners must go to get our passports stamped and our visas, and it's always a big, complex process. The thing that the Chinese don't have, unlike, say, in the U.S., which is an immigration enforcement division that goes through and checks visas and arrests people and has the power of arrest, that is done by the Gong'an, the PSB, the Public Security Bureau, at the local level. So slightly different system. So it doesn't have immigration enforcement, but it does have an immigration department. Small little clarification that I wanted to make, just in the name of that complexity we've talked about, Jiro, today. And I love the fact that she was struggling with China and struggling to get her head around it. I think we all have to have this humility because it is so complicated. This is what you and I have talked about over the years about the lack of China literacy in many African governments. And by the way, this is not uniquely an African thing. We see it in the West. We see it in, in Asia. It, it is a, a really a universal problem. But books like news are absolutely important because she comes at it from a very different perspective than, say, a political scientist would or a think tanker would or an academic. The fact that she's a travel writer just added so much more humanity to her storytelling. And that is something that I think is what made this book so powerful. And I just cannot recommend that if you're interested in the question of China-Africa relations, particularly on the more personal level, the human side, this is a must read. It's really complete the it's really it's really complete the the book the the, the documentary we recovered a few weeks back with the story of the Chinese immigrant walk in Central African Republic and today we are talking about the story of African immigration in China so I think yes I'm really loving those stories that we are covering on those human side that allows to give a different perspective yeah I mean so that was the eat bitter. 
exactly. From It Beater to Black Ghost, definitely I'd recommend you to hear the two shows and the two different perspectives. And you're going to see that the China Africa story is beyond the billions, beyond the debt issues, beyond all those narratives that we talk about. They are really, really human, human side and people, individual people are beyond those stories that makes China Africa relation what it is today. I didn't have a chance to ask her about this, but one of the things that she dived into a lot was not only did she talk about Africans in China or Nigerians in China, but then she talked about the differences between the Igbo, the Yoruba, the different Nigerian groups that are all there, and they themselves have these complex dynamics and relationships. So again, this is why we need to resist the simple overarching narratives of quote-unquote and i'm using my air quotes here which you can't see on an audio podcast (laughs) of africans and even chinese i mean one of the funny things is that when you live in africa and i've spent so much time there in the chinese community and you'll have new chinese immigrants who arrive to africa and say where's the chinese community and they say oh well they're over there good i'm gonna go the other direction i don't want to be anywhere near them and you think there's this kind of ethnic or national solidarity which there isn't Just as the Nigerians are a very diverse group in China, the Chinese in many African countries are equally diverse. Some come from Zhejiang, some come from Shandong, from Shanxi, from Guangdong, from Beijing, from Shanghai, from all over. They speak different languages, they have different cultures. And so in that respect, I think there's some interesting comparisons and similarities that we can can look at. And Nu does delve into that, and it's remarkable that she only spent three months there and produced a book like this. And it, it's just incredible. And, it, you know, because I would never have been able to produce that level of nuance that she was able to do. And so I, again, you know, I'm gushing about this and you don't hear me on this show gush too much about, you know, these new books, but this one is, is special. It really is special. Yeah, it's a very good book. It's a very good book. And as, as you said, it brings that because she's a travel writer. So she really... She she really like, you know, she doesn't go into those deep anal- social analysis. She's just like, tell people's story. The way she sees is the what she, what she sees and what she feels. And uh, without adding up anything else, she's just like, you know, this is what I saw. And I think that people need to start doing that as well to kind of understand, yeah, behind those big problems, there are sometimes very simple people with simple stories to tell. And as a longtime resident or former resident of Hong Kong, Uh, She spent some time in Chungking Mansions, and that is just, if you've never been to Chungking Mansions in Hong Kong, you've got to see it. It is something incredible. It's beyond description about, it's this... It's this United Nation. She called it a Tower of Babel. And there's something like 90 languages spoken inside one big apartment building. And there's this mini United Nations that's in there of all these different immigrants. It's really something fantastic. I spent a long time there when I was younger. And so she brought back a lot of of really wonderful memories. So again, I'll put links to the book in the show notes. I hope that you'll take a listen to it. I mean, again, I listen to the audio book, but read it. It's a Kindle version as well. And then as Giraud pointed out, it does pair nicely with the documentary Eat Bitter, which is now making the rounds of the film festival circuit. We spoke with the Chinese director, and then Jero, you spoke with Central African Republic director. So this is, again, you know, a nice companion. If you speak French, you should go listen to Jero's interview with the director, and I'll put links to all of those as well in the show notes. So that'll do it for this edition of the China in Africa podcast. What a great way to start out our 15th year of producing this show. We're very excited for the shows we've got planned for the year ahead and hope that you'll continue to join us. And if this is the type of work that you find fascinating, we hope that you'll consider a subscription to support the journalism that Jero, Kobus, Johnny, and the rest of the team do at the China Global South Project. Go to chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. There's a free trial for 30 days. If you don't like it, you can cancel any time. Also, we have a 50% off discount for students and teachers. Just email me at eric at chinaglobalsouth.com and I will send you the links for those discounts. So for Giro Nima in Mauritius, I'm Eric Olander. We really appreciate you taking the time to listen to this week's episode and we'll be back again next week with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. The discussion continues online. Tag us on Twitter at China GS Project and visit us at ChinaGlobalSouth.com. If you speak French, check out our full coverage at projetafriquechine.com and 
Afrique Chine on Twitter. That's Afrique with a K. And you'll also find links to our sites and social media channels in Arabic. <laughs>